Hey everyone. Thanks for joining us for our Facebook event today about insects. My name is Monica Williams and I'm with USDA's Agricultural Research Service. I'll be moderating this Facebook event and we'll be here together for say 30 minutes talking about those pesky household insects that we sometimes find to be a nuisance. We have bug expert, Dr. Tracy Lesky, who is a research entomologist and director at the ARS Appalachian Fruit Research Station out in Kearneysville, West Virginia. And Dr. Lesky is here to answer your insect questions. So before we get started with the questions, let's meet Dr. Lesky and find out what type of research they do at their location. Hi, Monica. Yes, hi, I am an entomologist and I study the behavior and chemical ecology of invasive and persistent native pests of tree fruit. And we try to develop sustainable solutions for their management. Great. Okay, so we already have quite a few questions, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So here's your first question, Dr. Lesky. My initial reaction to bugs in the house is to stomp on them, especially spiders. Is there a better way to handle these insects during the fall and winter months? Sure, so let's talk about insects and spiders because actually, although they're closely related, they're not the same. Insects have three pairs of legs, six legs total, whereas spiders have eight or four pairs of legs. The things they have in common is a, sort of a hard exoskeleton. Their skeleton is on the outside. They have um, a segmented body as well as jointed appendages, but that's where the similarities end. And then in terms of managing uh, the different invaders in our home, we really need to know who they are so we can come up with the best strategies for their management because depending on the insect species, they may be seeking different things. Okay. All right, so how can I control insects in my home without using insecticides? Sure, that's a great question, Monica. So one of the things that we want to think about is who's coming in in the fall. And some of the key uh, invaders that we typically see are the invasive brown marmorated stink bug, the Asian ladybird beetle, as well as our native box elder bugs. And so why are they coming in? They're really seeking a place to spend the winter, kind of a cool, tight, dry place where they can just chill out. So how do we keep them from getting in? We exclude them to begin with. So doing things like replacing weather stripping, taking those, um, those window air conditioning units out, maybe putting a screen on gable and vent, just sealing up those cracks and crevices so they can't get in. And that's really a good way to manage them and reduce their ability to get in and really just take up residence. Thank you. Okay, is there any way to protect outdoor insects that are beneficial to my garden to help them overwinter? Sure, we have a number of generalist predators that we might find around our homes and there are ways we can protect them. For example, Prim mantids overwinter in the egg stage. It's called an oatheca. So if you come across one of those and it's in an area where it won't be disturbed, go ahead and let it live there. That's a good place for them and um, they can hatch in the spring. Asian ladybird beetles, they might overwinter in your garden shed, you know, and they eat a lot of aphids in the spring. So uh, another good way. And things like ground beetles can overwinter in some of the leaf litter and natural areas on your lawn. Okay, so when I see that praying mantis on, in the bush, when I go outside my door, I should just leave them there, right? Oh yeah, they are a great <laughs> layer of insect pests. Okay, great. All right, here's one about stink bugs. Stink bugs have been a really big thing in recent years. I'd rather not kill them. So do you have any ideas? Well, let's talk about those stink bugs because the stink bugs that typically people are seeing in their homes are invasive. That means they're not native to the United States and they don't have the natural enemies that they evolved with to really keep their populations in check. So in this case, it's the brown marmorated stink bug, which is native to Asia, parts of Asia, China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Their populations really exploded and that's why we see more of them coming in. Um, you know, if you don't want to kill them, you can put them back outside, but here's the thing. 
These also are a serious pest of many crops, things like apples, peaches, tomatoes, soybeans. So really, I would say don't have a lot of mercy when it comes to stink bugs. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here's another question for you. I always have a problem with ants entering my house in the fall as the weather gets cooler and again in the spring as they try to escape the April showers. Any advice on how to control them? Sure. The thing about ant is, and depending on where you live in the country, there are many, many, many different species of ants. And depending on the time of the year and the species, they're seeking different things. But typically, when they're out foraging, they're looking for food, and it's either sugar or protein sources. So one good way to really manage them is to remove their capacity to find food. You know, it could be crumbs on the floor. It could be unsealed containers of food. It could even be a container of pet food. So take those resources away, because once a single ant finds a resource, and they lay down chemical trails that allow other members of their colony to come, and then you have many more. So take away the resources, that helps reduce their populations coming into your home. Thank you, Dr. Lesky. So tell me, where are you right now? It looks like you're in a greenhouse. I am. I'm in a greenhouse at the Appalachian Fruit Research Station, and this particular greenhouse is filled with plants that we use for our colonies, both for the brown marmorated stink bug, and another recent invasive, you may have heard about the spotted lanternfly. So, you know, it's really kind of like a cafeteria for insects, and that's what we have to do to maintain colonies to conduct our research. Okay, here's another insect question for you. I'm always finding silverfish in my bathroom, but nowhere else in the house. Why is that, and how do I get rid of them? Well, that's a great observation that really provides a clue why you're only finding them in the bathroom. And it really has to do with humidity. Uh, silverfish need higher humidity. And so um, in this case, what they're doing is they probably found a place where you may have a leaky pipe or um, you know, some other source where it, it, like if it's in your basement or something when there's higher humidity. So the best thing to do is really you know, um, take care of that leaky pipe, put a dehumidifier in your basement, and that will help reduce um, their populations. Silverfish themselves really feed on starchy substances. They might feed on things like, um, you know, book bindings or glue from wallpaper, even sometimes getting into flour or cereal boxes. So, um, you know, again, reducing the humidity, making it less hospitable for them. Okay, so here's one that I can relate to because my grandmother does this too. So. My grandmother swears that mothballs keep insects at bay and has them hanging in her closets. Is that a safe way to keep insects away? Well, you know, we've really moved away from mothballs. They are registered pesticide. They're made of a compound called naphthalene. They're not really a repellent. What they do is it's a solid that breaks down into a gas and it kills, you know, the cloth-eating moth species that we have. So the best way to deal with them is to just um, rather than use mothballs, you can use dry cleaning, you can do simple washing, or you can just, you know, store your um, clothes in a cedar chest, something like that. But if you are going to use mothballs, they should be in a sealed container. They shouldn't just be hanging in a closet. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, here's one about those electronic uh, devices. I've seen electronic and ultrasonic products to treat insects. Is this a, way, a safe way to get rid of insects? Yeah, there are uh, those kind of products. I've seen them advertised as well, but unfortunately, none of the data support that they really do repel insects. So I would stay away from those for their management. Save your money. <laughs> Save your money, exactly. Okay, so this one is about essential oils. I'm big on the use of essential oils, are there any examples of essential oils that would be useful for treating insects? Well, you know, there's probably some common examples that you may be familiar with, Monica, things like citronella, which can be used as kind of a repellent for mosquitoes. It doesn't really do as much sort of repelling the insects, it just kind of masks our odor. But there are other examples as well. For example, Japanese cedar oil has actually been used and has some, there's some data out there that it may repel silverfish, going back to that insect pest that we talked about. Okay, 
Do insects really give off pheromones to attract other insects? Yes, they do. So, you know, and one of the things, when you think about being a small insect in a large world, how can you find each other? And so one of the ways insects find each other in the environment is through chemical communication, meaning the release of pheromones. And so these pheromones can be used to bring together, you know, male and female insects so that they can reproduce and continue on. And so this is very common among a lot of species of insects to use pheromones. What can I do to prevent insect infestation? Is preventative insect control helpful? Absolutely. Prevention is great. And so some of the things you have to think about is what are the insects seeking? Is it shelter? Is it a particular environment like the humidity we talked about for silverfish? Or is it food? So take away the things that they need, you know, clean, declutter, um, you know, reduce humidity in your house, make sure your uh, plumbing is, is well sealed up and not leaking. And also, you know, for those fall invaders, again, exclude them through, you know, good insulation, weather stripping, those points, kind of things. Really, it, it, it's a good way to just, you know, really reduce the issues in your home. Okay, this one is about stink bugs. And I guess depending on where you live in the country, uh, you might be seeing stink bugs in your house. So here's your question. How do I get rid of stink bugs out of my house? Where are they coming from? Well, usually if you've already found stink bugs in your home, they're already there. Typically stink bugs move into people's homes between mid-September and mid-October, and then they spend the winter there. So again, excluding them in the fall is a good way to deal with them. Now, one of the things about this stink bug, the brown marmorated stink bug we're talking about, is that depending on where you live, you may have to deal with more of them. We've found through citizen science studies that people who live in rural environments where there are a lot of different host plants that they feed on, they typically get more stink bugs in their homes. Whereas people in more urban environments, not quite as many. Also, people that have homes that are sort of naturally colored, like brown, gray, silver, and also covered with natural materials like stone and wood, unfortunately get more stink bugs. So again, excluding them is the best way to keep them out and so that you do not have those non-paying tenants all, all winter long in your home. Okay, so I saw a stink bug on my wall and I left out of the house and I came back hours later. The stink bug was still in the exact same spot. Why is that? Well, you know, Monica, that stink bug probably is running out of resources, meaning it doesn't have enough sort of gas to take it through the winter during that overwintering period. So it's become active and it's seeking something. It's probably pretty weak and it's going to die. But I realize that, you know, when you see one walking across your television or your computer or sitting on your toothbrush in the winter, it can be a little bit disconcerting. But honestly, those are the weakest bugs and they're probably going to die soon. Okay, I won't panic. <laughs> <laughs> Don't panic, Monica. <laughs> okay, uh, here's one about spiders. Are spiders actually good bugs to have in your house? Well, uh, you know, the great thing about spiders is they do consume a lot of insects and a lot of insect pests. Um, you know, what I typically say is if they're not in my living space, I really just leave them alone. The ones that are in my attic or in my basement, and I have an old Victorian house, so, you know, I get a, a fair number of spiders. I leave them. But, you know, I realize they can be a little bit disconcerting in a living space. So, you know, just maybe pick them up with a paper towel and a plastic cup and take them outside to a sheltered location where they can start again and really set up shop and hopefully take care of some of those insects that might come in your house. Okay, this one is about uh, bugs living in your house. Is it beneficial to have certain bugs living in your house and are there bugs that would be a problem for your kids or your parents or say your pet pets? Well, you know, there really aren't a lot of insects that we could say, oh, you know, it's really they're providing a lot of benefits to us. So not really, um, you know, and so I would say, you know, it's better just to try to keep your home clean, exclude those insects so that you don't have any issues. Okay. So we have time for a couple more questions before our time is up here. Um, here's another one. Why do I see more bugs in the home in the winter versus other seasons? Sure, that's a good question. 
you know, probably one, one reason is in the winter, we're inside more. So we have more time to observe what's going on inside our homes. But the other is, of course, we do have these fall invaders. Things like box elder bugs and stink bugs and ladybird beetles, Asian ladybird beetles. They're more obvious. And again, it's those that we typically see that are running out of resources that are walking around that become obvious to us when we're in our homes in the winter months. Okay, thank you. Um, is it okay for my pets to eat bugs found in the home? <laughs> well, you know, Monica, I would say everything in moderation. But, you know, if, you're, if your pet maybe eats one or two, it's probably not a problem, but I wouldn't let them eat a lot. In fact, my own cat ate a brown marmorated stink bug. The stink bug released those defensive compounds, and unfortunately, that caused my cat to foam at the mouth. But, you know, <laughs> she's much wiser now, and she no longer tries to eat or chase stink bugs. She leaves them to me. <laughs> okay, I guess she learned her lessons. They're stinky little critters. They are. Yeah, so my cat actually ate a cricket one time. She didn't have any kind of reaction or anything like that, but she was just ready to go on to the next thing, like it didn't even bother her. Well, you know, some, I mean, I've eaten cricket stir fry fries in the past. It's part of that, you know, insects that we can use as food. So maybe it was pretty tasty. I found the cricket stir fry not bad at all. <laughs> Okay, here's another one for you. Uh, I think this might be our last question. Do bugs attract rodents such as mice and rats? Um, not really. It's really, again, it's the same principle. If there are resources for rodents like rats and mice, um, you know, like food, that's where they're going to come from. It's not so much that the insects themselves are attracted. Okay, I think we can squeeze in one more. Uh, okay. which, which household bugs bite or sting? Um, you know, we really don't have a lot that you would find in your home typically that bite or sting. We do have obviously the spiders, which can bite, but they're pretty shy. But among the nuisance pests, really none of them are, 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 are um, more likely to bite you. If anything, they, it's more like a near miss where they just don't know what they are tasting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, folks. Um, the time went by so quickly. It was a lot of fun. Dr. Lesky, thank you so much for answering our insect questions and educating us about safe ways to get rid of those insects, as well as helping us to understand them a bit better. Thank all of you for joining us today for our Facebook event. Thank you for all the great questions. You can find this event as well as our past Facebook events on our website at www.ars.usda.gov. And don't forget to connect with us and follow us on social media. See you next time.